Hi, I'm Peter Prevos, and welcome to the screencast for Chapter 11 of Data Science for Water Utilities. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at working with dates in the R language and some basic time series analysis using digital metering data, creating a diurnal curve. But before we can do that, first look at some basics. To find the current date, we have the sys.date function. Please note the, the capitals here. So sys.date gives us the date. And it looks like a character string because we have the quotation mark, but it's actually not a character string. The variable that's shown here is a date, which is a special type of variable. And a date var variable behind it has an integer number. So if we say as numeric of the system date, so the number version of it, convert this to a number, we see that we have 19,524 days since the start of the Unix epoch. What is a Unix epoch? Well, that's the 1st of January, 1970, when counting started. For spreadsheets, by the way, this is uh, the 31st of December, 1899. We can also construct dates, like you would do in a spreadsheet, from a number. So if we say the 20,000th day, and origin is 1970-0101, then we can use the Unix epoch, if it's a number that comes out of a spreadsheet, you will have to use the origin as the 31st of December, 1899. So you get a different date. Date as it is stored, as it is displayed on the screen, by default is the ISO 8601 format. And ISO 8601 is all about how to format time and date strings. To create a date variable, we can use the as.date function. And as.date with a capital D, we can then insert a character string in ISO 8601 format. So that's the year in four decimals, a dash, then the month and the day separated by a dash n in two decimals. So this is then a date format, which again looks the same on the screen, but it is actually a date format. But within the R language, you can use a lot of different date formats and also create your own. So for example, if I have a text string in a data set that is written like this, 1 July 2022, which is very common, then we can instruct or we can inform the R language that the format of this date starts with a day so that's the percent sign and a small d. Then we have a percent sign and a capital B, which stands for the name of the month. And then percent style sign and capital Y, which is the year in four digits. So doing this enables R to understand that written text and it converts it here to a date. You can also have more exotic formats if you like so as date we have day semicolon 12 comma month etc etc then we can instruct well, let me pull it on another line we can instruct how to say that the format in this case looks like words i copied so how do i create this i copied this text we'll interpret anything that starts with a percent sign so this is the day the month is then the percent sign M, and four decimals is Y. If it's a small Y, then it's a two-digit year. So if we do this, we create 2023-0612, which is exactly what's written here. And we can also format date variables to a string by using the format function. So in this case, we convert the current day into the name of the week with capital A, percent capital A, then the, the word week. Percent V is the week number, a comma, and again, the year in four decimals. Now, all these different abbreviations and see which does which, the help file for the strip time function, so that's strp time, contains complete documentation where are we? Here we go. So 
percent sign small a is the abbreviated weekday name. We've already seen the one with the capital A, which is the full weekday name, and so on and so on. And you see there's a, a lot of different ways to extract information from a time variable. You can also do calculations with times, but because it, it, although a time is an underlying num, uh, integer, it's not a numeric variable. So if I create a, a variable D, which is the current date, system, the system date, minus, I see that D is a time difference of 19,635 days. So that's not an integer that we can do calculations with. So D times two um, still gives this time difference. To turn that into a normal number, you need to then convert it with an S numeric to create an integer. This is everything about dates. Now we're looking at date slash time variables. So in the R language is a POSIX variable and the s.posix ct, which is a POSIX character, the C for character. There's also a list version, which I won't discuss here, which is s.posix lt. So for example, the, the 12th or uh, 21st of December, 2020 at 122300. If I convert that to a POSIX variable, I see that it's turned into a time variable, and I can confirm that with the class function here. So the class that is a POSIX CT. What you see here is that it also adds a time zone for UTC. Now that will become important later. Time zones can be confusing. Just like with the, uh, with the date variables, I can also create formatting functions here. So 21 December, 2020, 12, 23. And then I hit the format string. Again, you can find that in, in a strip time help file. Is another way of doing this. Let's look at time zones. The sys.time function gives me the current date and time, 2023, 6, 16, and it's 7 or 7. 13 UTC. So by default, on, because I'm working on the cloud version, it defaults everything to UTC. If I do this on my own desktop, there is a, a, a local installed and it will be in the Australian Eastern Standard Time. I can look at the system time zone and you see here that it is UTC, as I mentioned. What I can do, um, it doesn't make any sense, but um, I can, for example, format this. At Australia, Melbourne. And there we go. So you see that the actual time, the time that I'm living in right now, is 17.08.04. So this is now converted to the Australian time zone. But this is, this is a character string. This is only the way it's formatted. Class function in front of this. And in front of this, this way, it is a character. So it's only the format function only changes the way the date is displayed. And then I can go to New Zealand time as well. And if you want to know the, the list of names, there is a function. Olson names and the Olson names function. There we go. It gives you a detailed explanation. And there's also in here um, a reference to where you can get a list of all the. So if I run this function, the Olson names function, see here I get all the time zones that this installation of the R language knows about. So for example, I can say AMS is sys time. So AMS is now this UTC time. If I want to change the time zone of that variable, so actually change its 
its uh, one of its attributes, I have to use the attribute function. So I'm saying the attribute of AMS and the attribute I'm changing is the time zone shall be Europe Amsterdam. And now you see that AMS has changed to CEST, Central Eastern European Time, which is two hours in front of UTC at this point in time. The class of AMS is a POSIX. Putting it all together, uh, we can also add a time zone to our S POSIX CT function. So if I have a string that says 21 December 2020, 12, 23, there's my format string to convert this. And then I can say the time zone is Vancouver. It's one of the Olsen names, not the Olsen twins, the Olsen names. Then we see here that we get a time string, a time character, a POSIX character that is set in PST. I believe it's the Pacific time zone, something like that. Now there is a little issue, especially if you live close to the deadline like I do. So let's say I've got a variable here, D, which is the 22nd of February at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the time zone is Australia. Is D. Now it says here Australian Eastern Daylight Time, because that's what I defined. If I convert this as to a date, it jumps to the 21st, because in UTC, that is the 21st. And the S date function by default, unfortunately, uh, changes the time zone to UTC unless otherwise instructed. So to make sure that I get a good date conversion for my POSIX variable, I always add TZ equals Australia slash Melbourne in my case. This is a quick introduction into the base functionality within the R language. The date package, which is part of the tidyverse, provides some additional functionality. So we'll call the library, and there's some functions that are slightly more elegant, So, which is why tidyverse is called the syntactic sugar. It's a way to make the syntax of R a little bit more palatable. So the null function instead of the sys.time function. The year function extracts the year from a date time variable. And then we have the month, the day, and the week variable. And the outcome of that is a character string, uh, excuse me, a numeric. Other useful functions within Lubridate are the flooring, the rounding, and the ceiling functions. Floor date will round the date down by the unit that you want it to be. So in this case, our is 712 UTC. If I round that down, it should be 700 UTC. There we go. I can also round the date for now, unit by day. So in other words, the time is then reset to midnight. What we can also do is pick the last day of the month, for example, and the ceiling of the date goes up, um, round rounds like in mathematics, where above than half goes up and below half is down, and floor always goes down. So ceiling date, unit month, um, C takes me to the 1st of July, because it rounds, it rounds up the month. Want to change the time zone? There are two functions within that, that do the same as the attribute function that we used up here, but it's called with tz and force tz. So with tz changes the way the date time variable is displayed, and force tz actually changes the characteristic, the attribute of that variable. Now we're coming to a, an actual case study, which is a digital metering case study. For this case study, I synthesized some digital metering data by using some assumptions. Now that's all explained in another blog post and you'll find the link on my website. The re main reason I did this is because it's not necessarily easy to get this type of data from a water utility. The other reason is that by using synthetic data, I know exactly what's in the data. So, um, it makes it easier to create a teaching examples. So let's open um, the reader and deploy libraries. And I read the data set, which is called meter reads. 
Now let's have a quick look at this data set. It is pretty straightforward. We have a device ID, so there are 100 devices in this data set, and they have a random ID. So that's the location, the house, if you like. A timestamp, which is in UTC, and a count. Now, a count means that five liters has gone through the water meter. That's just the way this particular type of water meter works, and a, and a lot of other water meters work the same way. So. A one means we means one revolution of the dial, which is then measured by the dial log on the digital meter. But other brands could have other methods. Okay. So there's a bunch of things I can do with this data. So I can group it by device ID. Um, I then calculate the volume by uh, in kiloliters, by divide by thousand. And I take the maximum mi minus the minimum, and then I arrange it. So this is just a little recap of previous chapter. And I'll have my um, highest water consumers on, on the top and the lowest at the bottom. We could also create a table with uh, transmissions. Meter reads. I then convert that to a date. In this case, I don't have to add a time zone because this setup is in UTC, but ideally I would uh, TZ equals um, UTC, just. Date and, and create a bug. So the meter reads, I add, convert the timestamp to a date and I can count the number of device IDs by date. And then I know how often they have transmitted. Because in principle, they should transmit, uh, let's make this big, bigger. In principle, they should transmit once per day, but not all of them do, as you can see. Missions, good. Now let's filter this transmission table because there's a lot of, um, lot of data in here, where the date is the second. February 2050. Because on purpose, again, I created this synthetic data set to be set sometime in the future just to avoid any confusion that it might be real data. In the filter function, I can say as date 2050, and then I get my filtered data set. What I can also do is um, leave out the as date because the filter function dplyr package is smart enough to recognize that that would be a date. And this only works for ISO 8601 types. A handy function to use is the between function. So between date as date 2015 and as date um, these two dates is the same as saying larger than or equal than this and greater than or uh, smaller than or equal than that. So between is also a handy function for time series. And of course, I can also do um, do this directly from the timestamp, but again, be mindful when you use as date with your time zones. You can use Lubridate to lubricate this a little bit. Uh, so here's all my transmissions for the year 2050. Um, I can have all the transmissions for the month, or, month of March in 2050 by using the floor date function. And I can, then going back to the meter reads, I can, for example, also take all the meter reads that were at the 1st of March 2050 at 10 a.m. in the morning for each of the water meters. Round it down, because what you see here is that each water meter, which I forgot to mention, pulses at a random time within the hour. That's to prevent all the, uh, the base stations to receiving thousands of signals at the same time. So by rounding that, I can say, give me pulse that was nearest to 10 o'clock in the morning. Because in this case, we are already in the UTC time zone on this cloud service. Um, we don't have to use as POSIX, et cetera. I can just use the Bring directly here, and the dplyr will automatically know to convert this if it's in ISO 8601 format. And we get, of course, we can get creative. 
where we say format timestamp is the short month and the four digit year, um, and so on and so on. So lots of different ways to slice your data set by by time. Oh, one way to use the floor date function is to let's say we have the transmissions and I want them for each month. So I'm grouping this by the floor date of the date by month. Then I can summarize this by doing a count, um, which, uh, excuse me, summing the, uh, the number of transmissions and then do some uh, mutations to work out the averages. The days and months function from Lubridate um, gives you the days in that specific month, which might be 8, 28, 29, 30, or 31. So here, this now creates a table where we have the month, and there's four months in this data, the number of total number of transmission, the number of days in that month, and then the mean transmissions. And April 2050 is not quite complete, so that's why it's so long. What we really want to do is calculating the flow, because these devices measure the cumulative flow, but I want to know the flow in liters per hour. So we have a transmission each hour and it's measured in liters. Very important for this are the lag and the lead functions. And if I evaluate here lag one to 10, you'll see that I get a new vector with NA, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So lag, it looks at the uh, the value before the current one. And the first one is NA because there's no zeroth value. If I take the lead, I get the reverse. It looks at like the next value. So I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, sorry, two, three, four, five, to 10. And an NA because there is no 11 value in this string. Now we can use that to calculate differences between subsequent rows. So let's look at the meter reads table. Let's take this step by step. The grouping it by the ICD creates 100 um, groups. My volume is now the count. Mine is the lag of the count, and the default is zero, so that, that uh, removes the NA. And I multiply by five, like we did before. I can do the same thing for the time. It's the timestamps. One is the lag of the timestamp. And the flow is then the volume divided by time. At the at the edges of the data, so I remove those and then I ungroup the file and presto, the result is now a data set that has a similar the same size or similar size, but it gives me the count, the volume, the time. So it's one hour between drinks. In some cases, it might be more if there's a missing a missing read, and then here is the flow. in the liters per hour in this case. I want to know the flow at midnight every day for all these devices. Now, as I explained, these devices either might not send a signal at all, at all so midnight might be missing, and they all pulse at a random time in the hour. So one meter might be 20 minutes before midnight, and the neighbor's meter might be 10 minutes past midnight. So we need to do some interpolation to get all the reads at midnight. Interpolation, um, I have a little example here. So let's create an X variable, which is today, plus 0, 7, 10, and 15 days. So X will be this. We have a bunch of dates. Then Y are some random numbers. And I can, for example, plot X comma Y, and it looks something like this. The approx function is used for linear interpolations, and it's a very powerful function. Let's use the default, approx x, comma y. What this function now does, it divides the minimum and between the minimum and the maximum in 50 observations. That's that's the default. Then the output, as you shall see, shall see, the x are my 50 values, and these are the numbers of the dates. And here's the Y values. So 
If I plot that, it looks like this. And then I can put the coins, the points on for my. Um, linear regression I put the XY points on on here there we go so red are the original points and the gray line is my interpolation there was also a constant interpolation which assumes that we have the same value until we reach a new value but in this case uh, so that I'm saying the method is constant and you can read about that in the help file but I don't want 50 interpolations I want nine. So here's constant, and where's my plot? Okay, I can also put some points in for constant, and there you go. So you see here that the, the red value is maintained until we get close to the next one, then we go up, uh, maintained, go to the next one, maintain, and go to the next one to close. So putting, and we can also create a point in the approx function um, by saying the X out, so my single point is eight and a half days after today is my point, and putting all together, the plot looks like this. So this is the basics of linear interpolation in the R language. How do we now use this to calculate daily flows? First, I'm creating a vector which is daily dates, because I want all the, the dates that are in the data set at midnight. Because I'll, I'll use that in a minute. Then we take the meter reads, grouping it again by ID, and I use the reframe function instead of the summarize function. Now in the book, I use a summarize function, but that is not deprecated for this particular case. You can read in the reframe documentation why it needs to be that way. So running this gives me a data frame where for midnight, I have a count. And if I have a count, I can calculate the volume, remove the NAs and throw it into a plot. And here's a histogram of all the midnight flows or daily volumes, if you like. By putting all this together, we want to create some diurnal curves because diurnal curves are really the sacred graph of water resource management. Now, how do we do this? So in this case, we're gonna create a diurnal curve for the whole period uh, for the cumulative flow of all the water meters within this data set. So we've got my meter flow. Now I need to convert this to Australian timestamp because it is in, in UTC. So I say with TZ, I'm creating a timestamp underscore AU. Then I work out an hour variable, which is the hour of the rounded date by hour. Then I group it by hour, and then I work out my flows. So now I'm doing it. Excuse me. Got to create a variable. So here we go. Now I have meter flow. So meter flow is the variable I created earlier with the flow rates for each hour. And we create the next bit, which is uh, rounded all the hours, group it by hour, and then we can calculate. Okay, here we go. That well, gives me, here's my journal um, data set. I have each hour from 0 to 23. I have a minimum flow, a mean flow, and a maximum flow. And with that, I can create this wonderful diurnal curve. So this is all for chapter 11, working with dates and times. There's a lot more advanced things you can do with the R language. It has built in a REMA modeling if you want to do predictive modeling, but that's uh, unfortunately outside the scope of this book. In the next chapter, we're going to look at finding some anomalies and doing some leak detection with this same data set. Thanks for your time.